Decadent swine and lofty angels, all marred here with me to blame. Dastardly thought and bohemian living, God won't pardon and we want no forgiving. For though we walk in the shadow of lace, within our hearts but a fiery flame. Of smut, gore, and stuttering rhyme. All come accepted, all in due. I'm still working on a catchphrase. You know why I like doing this? Because it's as educational for me as it is for you. Look at my past videos. Seriously, look at them, I need more views. I did, and I see I'm a bit all over the place, and half the time it doesn't feel like I know what I'm talking about. Further on, I didn't set this channel up just to do editorials about a crap game like Agony, but that's still what's gotten the most attention from me for more than a month now. They're simple and easy to make, and they don't require as much involvement as the art videos. And learning from these mistakes, this will be the last video I make about Agony, and I will do it with focus and clarity, talking about what does and doesn't work, and why. Let's recap. Agony promised to revolutionize the horror game experience by taking old elements and applying them in more extreme ways to create an unforgettable experience. Unfortunately, Madmind Studios didn't deliver on their promise and the game was universally panned as boring, bland and buggy. I still like where they were going with it. I support anyone trying to broach the borders of what you can and can't show, even if they failed, and that's why I am taking an artistic look on the environment, creatures and experience of one of the most hated games of 2018. From the very start, Madmind Studios had its work cut out for itself because there are two types of horror game. Either a game wants to jar you by making you feel like you're in danger as you play, or it only uses horrific designs as a backdrop for an adventure. Agony tried to do both, which is the single hardest thing for any developer to pull off, because not only does the design need to be so frightening it will affect even seasoned players, but also deliver a gameplay that robs you of any sense of safety and kicks your fight or flight instinct into overdrive. Agony starts off well in its design, as we're greeted by what looks like a medieval fortress built from human tissue and painted by Caravaggio. It's a disturbing thing with a dramatic flair, and even if it isn't groundbreaking, it still looks amazing. However, as we go deeper, it feels like the design team rather lost its spread. The outside was very baroque and threatening, but the inside feels Art Nouveau, which is inherently beautiful. It looks good. But it doesn't feel like the same place we just left, and the same thing happens again and again the further we go. In any design, there needs to be a rhythm to how you experience it. If it changes, it needs to do so in a way that feels natural, or at least can be explained somehow. Agony breaks that rhythm again and again. That said, though all the songs are different, the album still has the same theme. I'm not saying the design of this game is totally random. What I'm actually saying is the itty bitty gritty isn't very well thought out. I want to make this pattern clear before we take a look at the actual areas. There are two halves to the first level of the game, with one focusing on the classic body horror, while the other is a dungeon. Now I love body horror in all its forms, and I can appreciate how amazing the many designs we see here are. The Art Nouveau I mentioned earlier is beautiful. I love how they combined organic form theory with actual organs. But despite how grandiose and palatial it is, I don't feel intimidated by any of it. It's just pretty. A quick hop, skip and fall to our death later and that is redeemed as we find ourselves in a labyrinth of bones and organs. This area is genuinely disgusting as we wade through a rotting slurry between walls of wet bones and tissue only occasionally lit by fires. I don't like the way it goes from soft flowing Art Nouveau to a system of boxes, but it's perfectly fine for what it is, it's a hellish labyrinth. But it also reminds me a lot of too many other games. It's not really striking and can even feel tedious. That pretty much sums up the entire first half of the level. It ranges from perversely gorgeous to passable. The Colosseum is by far the most impressive, balancing rigorous architecture with organs in a way where every area feels unique without breaking its rhythm 
and the darkness is as confusing as it's, as it's threatening. While it's nowhere near as striking as it should have been, because this was part of the demo released two years ago, it's still a remarkable design that I woe could not be replicated throughout the game. This raises a question. Um, th this is what Madmind Studios showed us to gather interest from the game. Um, okay, this is what they had before the Kickstarter ended. And then they took twice as long as they said they needed to make the game. And what we got, every aspect of the game that we got, every aspect that isn't the demo, looks half as good as every aspect that was the demo. How does that even happen? I mean, the, and the only thing that I can figure, uh, figure to explain it is they must have worked on the demo area, just the demo area, for uh, three or four years before they started the Kickstarter. That's the only thing that can explain it, how exactly that happened. And, uh, and that in turn raises the question, why did they need our money in the first place? I mean, I assume they had full-time jobs and so on, and this enabled them to work on it full-time. But if that was the problem, here's what they should have done. They should have set up a Patreon. They should have set up a Patreon where they posted, you know, um, uh, snippets of gameplay, hey, workflow, and animations, uh, CG models, all the things like that to reward and people. And then released installments of the game. Every area would be uh, something like a chapter they would release that would then form a larger narrative. That would have been amazing. I would have supported that. From body parts to bedrock, the next area begins with a shiny ravine adorned with giant faces and tongue tendrils before we move into the tunnels. It's pretty, and had it been a drawing, potentially an artsy fartsy scene, but it only works as a gateway to the inside of a mountain. This area is much cleaner and easier to navigate than earlier because there is much less going on, it's just a straightforward empty tunnel. The horror of it is much more under the surface than in your face, especially when succubi begin running through the creeks and only small things like burning bones and babies hung from the ceiling begins to manifest. This is an area where you shouldn't be and the horror almost manifests here. Going deeper it grows more complex, with more things for you to look at, and it feels like you're moving towards something. And this is what I meant by rhythm. The design shifts as you move through the place, but it's gradual and subtle. It keeps your interest and it guides you deeper. It's actually a very well made area, with a very pretty gothic body horror setting near the end, even if it isn't very memorable. Moving on, the second level starts at another demo area, the forest. It's a thick bramble foliage with trees that looks like sprouts of congealed blood. Thickets that look like they could reach through the screen and touch you, and a disgusting hue of red and black covering everything around you. It's a remarkably unpleasant place. It's a remarkably unpleasant place that does manage to merge the two game types, because as impressive as this area is, you feel just as threatened by the things crawling through it. Yes, it relies on the darkness to make everything else scarier, but it works to unsettle, and that's the most important thing. Another aspect to it is the horizon. While the first level closes you in, this time you're out in the open, and you can see just how massive hell is. It adds a lot, it creates the feeling of a landscape significantly larger than your immediate area, and it makes you feel small. It's not perfect, it's got plenty of reused props and very little to suggest distance, but it's enough to convey a feeling that this place is far bigger than you. It's also very cluttered, which does make it feel less natural, but it feels chaotic, and that to me is what hell should feel like. The way the red light sticks to nearly everything feels disgusting, like everything is sticky, and it's just as repellent as it's awesome. All in all, I am very happy with this area. If I have any complaint, it's more to do with the gameplay than the environment, but I'll get to that later. The further you go, the more signs of habitation appears, with ruins scattering more and more of the landscape until you find a pavilion of sorts where the red goddess awaits. Even this doesn't feel out of place, but more like a place within the environment. And the interior matches what we saw in the Colosseum dining hall very well. 
I wouldn't call it copied, but more like in tune with one another. The bone chairs might be a bit silly, but considering this is a home of the goddess, that makes a bit more sense, I think, no matter how cheesy the design is. From there we find ourselves in the floating forest, and this is where things start going a bit wrong. See, the forest itself is brilliant. It's dark and dramatic in the same way as before, and add to that it floats on boiling purple stuff. It's an absolute joy to behold! Actually, the purple stuff is just weird. It clearly should have been blood or tar or anything that wasn't purple. Either way, we hardly get to see any of it, because we're supposed to possess a demon who sees the world in black and white, turning it all into a confusing, strobing mess. Very low points on that. Also, while the ease with which you got lost earlier helped to add trepidation, now when you possess a demon and you're supposed to be unstoppable, you sure don't feel unstoppable when you get lost for the fourth time in a row. I, I know that sounds like a gameplay issue, but think about it. Think about it for a second. Um, the whole point of any game is to reach a goal and to have fun while doing it. It's the point of any game. I mean, it's the po the point is to do stuff and progress. That is the point of any game. Aim, and have fun while doing it. That is the point of any game. I'll stop saying that now and just move on to the point. The point I'm trying to make is, the point of this game is to go from one area to the next while interacting with the environment, which is supposed to be creepy and scary, and, uh, but in this case, you are supposed to be a domineering force of nature, running through the area, doing whatever the hell you want. And, and having lots and lots of very sadistic fun while doing it. Fun, 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 fun is the important hand word here. Fun. It is not fun if you can't freaking navigate the environment. And that is not a fault in the gameplay. That is a fault in the level design. That is a fault in the level design. <sighs> the floating forest is a cool idea with a good design, less than perfectly executed eventually finding ourselves in an even more confusing place called the Fractal Forest. We're allowed to escape the demon body we possessed to look around. This forest is different from the outside, with the trees being thicker, plains more open, and very little blood, but a lot of what I can only assume is some sort of spiritual energy floating around. This area doesn't work at all. The idea is all of it is some sort of an illusion, and by standing in certain places you can break it for a moment allowing you to find your way. However, this is ridiculously annoying, as time between illusion breaking and not actually finding your way isn't enough to get any sense of bearing. And while the real forest is brightly lit, this forest is so dark you can barely see the tree's outlines. Not to mention find your way anywhere. It's a good idea, handled very poorly, to plunge you into darkness in a threatening environment. But there is actually very little to fear here, making it just annoying. And because it's so dark, we can't actually appreciate any of the design, making it just an uncomfortable time stint. If you do manage to find your way out, you've arrived at a waterfalls of blood, and I'm happy to report the place lives up to the frankly epic name. For about five minutes. A new cave, adorned like a storehouse of hellish misc and clutter, it opens up to something out of the Lord of the Rings. A single man collapsed before the yawning maw of a gargantuan waterfall of blood, hurtling a flame down into an unknown abyss. You could not get more epic a scene than this. Except this game. Weirdly. The spiritual purples and pallid flames scattered among the roots are a bit strange, but you honestly need something to break up the visual tedium you've faced up until now, so this is a welcome relief. Watching a chort get buffed, dropped into water, and trying not to drown too early, we finally find ourselves in something called the Mushroom Mind. It's a swamp-like forest where vine trees grow between two planes of rippling water, both above and below us. It looks cool, I think, and I assume it's supposed to invoke a feeling of corrupt harmony, or perhaps just an acid dream, except the colors are nowhere near bright enough. Not that I know. Like the first level, this radically shifts environment after a while. After flying to the Tree of Life with a skinless succubus and defeating slash running away from a chort, we find ourselves in an ice area. It feels good to rest my eyes upon all of this blue after all the red of the past several hours. 
However, this is among the less appealing areas of the game. Not because it's cold, but this area marks the point where it felt like the maker simply stopped caring. It serves perfectly well as an environment to get through, and you can tell someone really worked on this place, but it's not as effective as the previous areas. While earlier I could look at a decoration or a whole environment and think it looks cool, the best way I can describe this area is neat. For example, succubi swimming around under crystal clear ice, neat. The colors change to red whenever you're under the water, confusing, but neat. The goddess addressing the player instead of the character. Do you think you have control over this? Sitting comfortably in your room, playing with darkness and demons. Stupid, but neat. Aside from all the neat things, it mostly looks boring. Unfortunately, my recorder stopped recording after a while, and I lost a significant amount of gaming, and I can't say anything more detailed about the experience. Just that it was right about here that the design started going so very wrong. I don't even know what this area is called, but I will briefly describe it. Having fallen down the bloodfalls, we find ourselves in a monochromatic nonsensical jumble of stone walkways, which frankly reminds me of games like Croc. All the colors are desaturated and bleak, and it isn't just because of the smoke from blood burning in the lava, it continues well away from it. Moving away from the entrance, we find a stone city of sorts, which shows the real problem of, of this area. It feels boxed in, and that's a sensation none of the other areas gave me. Because it's so barren, it feels strangely less alive than the rest of hell, and with so little to obscure the borders of the map, I realize how trapped I actually am. Beyond this area, through a ruin, the last area of the game awaits, and it suffers from the same problems times 10. See, this area is massive, astoundingly massive for a Kickstarter game. It, it feels like it's maybe a fourth of the Fallout 4 map, but despite this admittedly very interesting looking beginning, it contains hardly anything. Any environment in any game is built from basic forms usually starting with some kind of rolling hills for a base, to which you then add more shapes in the form of obstacles and then objects to give the specific character. The previous area have done this astoundingly well, with every place feeling organic, and I know I'm stuck on that word, but I'm not just talking about actual organic tissue. I mean it felt alive and natural, but this feels like a sandbox someone has dropped things into and never bothered to finish. Maybe I'm cruel for saying that, but it's the truth. Just take a look at this. There are colors and shapes of objects, but there is no feeling to them. There is no texture. And all of the colors blend into one another with no contrast or sense of lighting. It's ugly, it's barren, and I feel depressed looking at it, remembering where we come from. That's not to say all of it looks like that. You see, I think part of the reason it's so big, aside from it being the wrap-up of the entire game, is by now we're expected to have figured out our favorite gameplay. The goal is to cross the landscape and reach the Cathedral of the Red Goddess, and supposedly you can do that either as a demon, by running or flying across the field, ducking dangers and avoiding the admittedly very cool waves of fire, or going underneath it in the tunnels. The tunnels are essentially an elaborate repeat of the first level, with mouths and vaginas and other twisted flesh. Part of it looks good, part of it looks like a chewing gum playhouse. It's a confusing mix where clearly some bits got more work put into them than others. All of this finally leads up to the Cathedral of the Red Goddess. Now, it took me nearly 24 hours to finish this game, apparently twice what's needed. But tell me if you think this child's drawing is worth the wait. Is it not a huge disappointment that this is the house of the Lord of Hell? Further on, look at the flat, uninteresting graphics and ghastly environment. It looks like it was made in 2001, not 2017. I don't know what happened to the designers, but they clearly burnt out their creative reserves a while ago. Agony's environment was a watermark, starting so well with a tsunami washing over us, and then gradually retreating back into the sea, leaving us high and dry. But now, what of the demons? I've talked for so long about this I feel like collapsing, but I'll briefly run them down. Starting with the succubi, these are the priestesses of our divine herald of the nation and the Lepatimoth of the hellscape. 
Visually, they mostly look like Draenei that has fallen on hard times. They had to pay back the mortgage, about to lose their home, they walk a corner, one thing leads to another, y you know what I'm saying. Goat's hooves and a long agile tail lets them navigate anything from sheer cliffs to tight humid caverns in their hunt for still healthy humans to soil the landscape. After they've had their fun ripping skin and organs out from whatever foolish man seeks them out in lust. They're feminine, but dirty, and sound like they've smoked 14 cigarettes this afternoon alone. So fragile. Come with me, let's... let's find our queen. Attractive but disgusting, you know going near them is a really bad idea. Whether you worry about AIDS or having your heart ripped out to make them beautiful. They're very basic, of course, they are just females with little more to them. But the fact that naked women with claws and horns are monsters in an adventure horror game is a fascinating thing, even if they are at no point intimidating. And in a strange way, their dirty, disheveled simplicity makes them right at home in hell. Then we have the spider, one of the more disturbing monsters of the game, and the one I expected to see the most kinky Japanese fan art of before the game was panned. An amalgamation of limbs, it moves like a tumbleweed, or a mobile anemone through hell in search of whatever prey it can find. It's the main foe of the forest area of level 2, where it hides in the near complete darkness. This disturbing appearance and near invisible presence makes it a constantly unsettling surprise as you move through the forest, looking for a way out. Further on, like all the demons, it's completely blind and relies more on vibrations than hearing. You can walk or even run past it from a distance without it noticing, but if you get too close, it will follow you. Unlike the other demons, this blindness actually works in its favor, I think. To me, it seems creepier. If you forget about it, or don't pay attention to it, all of a sudden you're pounced by skin and limbs grabbing at you like a pervert in a bar. Ugh. However, it's also easily fended off, and that weakness turns it into more of an annoyance than a threat. It has an older, stronger sibling, which I can't find the name of, but I call it the spider nest. Spiders are reasonably simple. There are six arms set around a pod, but the nests are bigger, rolling amalgamations of whole bodies fused together like a human rat king. Unlike the spiders, these things can't climb, but they are so big they can take down other demons, and like the spider has no real sense of direction but simply rolls around the landscape until it bumps into you. This blindness doesn't work as well, because they actually have heads with eyes, and also they're so big you can never really not notice them, making them far less threatening. By the way, the spiders are adorable little pets. I want one! Uh, in an entirely innocent way. Now, my favorite of all the demons and the unquestionable symbol of agony. The Onoskelis, she with the ass's legs. I am not being coy, that is genuinely what Onoskelis means. I could go on for about an hour about everything I love about this feast. I love how it's juxtaposed drop dead gorgeous with absolutely revolting. I love the combination of ram, yoni and insect mandibles for a head. And I love how all of them are unique. Some of them have animal skulls between their mandibles, some have no horns, some are dark, some are armor plated, some are muscular. Every area of hell has its own unique take on it and I love that. Apparently the denizens of hell, or possibly the red goddess herself, does as well. Because there are more statues devoted to this creature than there are of the goddess in this game. I actually believed this was the red goddess before the reveal trailer was released. And I don't think anyone can blame me. Just look at it and tell me this is not the ultimate embodiment of everything agony is. Never mind the fact that it's blind except for when you possess it, it is bestial, seductive, repellent and unquestionably memorable. If anything good would ever be taken from this game, this horrifying, disgusting accusation of every animal drive you have is it. So what about the men? So far it's only been women and I don't think spiders actually have sexes. 
Don't be sad, Spider-Chan. Unless you count the Baphomet, there's only two male demons in this game. Satan, which you don't necessarily ever face, and the Chort. This lumbering bulk of muscle is the biggest breeding bull hell can offer. Like all the children of Satan, it's a satyr wandering the inner ways of hell in search of whatever unlucky enough to fall down before it, so it can tear them apart like paper. Its deformed head looks like it belongs in a cabinet of curiosities, with the shape of baby skulls and horns growing out of their eye sockets. Looking at it, I get a feeling it's inbred somehow, like hell cares less about this than any of the other demons, and it's only there as cannon fodder. That's not to say its design is very interesting, but considering where they could have gone with the one male demon in a game full of women aside from that is Satan, I don't want to complain about that. It's big, it's ugly, and it'll tear you to pieces. Not very interesting, but it's passable. I'm not going to talk about any of the unique demons, like Satan or Baphomet, only the recurring demons you meet all through your journey in hell, because this, vid this video is long enough already. Also, I never got to fight Satan, so I have no footage. Only two are left, and one is the ugly goddess. Note that I said ugly, not red. Like the spider, this is an amalgamation of body parts, but ten times more disgusting and powerful. This collection of entrails and muscle travel underground like a gelatinous flock of worms, only to burst up in front of you in the shape of a baphomet. They did get lazy after. Ah, well, uh, you know, there are different kinds of demons to take inspiration from. And finally, we're here. We have arrived. It's her turn, our purpose, our goal, the road we have traveled and the ultimate meaning of this whole adventure. Ladies and gentlemen, Inanna, Isis, the whore of Babylon herself, our divinity! So big and strong, he's afraid of a woman? Do I make you ashamed, my dear? In response to this, I'm going to inject what I said at the end of the game. That was it! Like I said earlier, for the longest time I believed Diana Skelis was the Red Goddess, and finding out she's actually some bald, bored-looking dominatrix is hugely disappointing to me. But, aside from my personal opinion of her, she doesn't look bad at all. For one thing, she is striking. Her alabaster skin contracts amazingly with the carnal red of her flowing blood robe, and the celestial crown of light keeps her color scheme from being too boring. The slight destruction of her flesh is a bit odd, considering she's supposed to be the divine ruler of this place, but I think it's a cool idea. What really sells her though is her attitude. One moment she's a sex kitten, the other a cold psychopath, but at no point do you mistake her playfulness for being submissiveness. She rules over you, and everything you see around you, and you never forget it. I'm above everything you believe in. The damned daughter of an infinite father. The one who brings balance into the damned relationship of blood and light. That's not to say she has a lot of character or personality. It's just that her attitude helps sell her appearance as part of the ruler of hell. Even if she is a disappointment for her goddess to me, there is no mistaking the position she holds above you and wherever else she damn well pleases. Whew, that was a long haul. Uh, I wanted to address more um, how, how the designs work in relation with gameplay, but uh, this video has been so how long I think we all want to go to bed now. Uh, thank you all so much for watching, um, I hope you see me again next week, and I hope you have a good time, until then.